We are wrapping up our series, The Masks That We Wear, and this morning we're looking at Herod and Herodias. So if you, want, if you got your Bible, you can go to Matthew 14 uh, just to get prepared for that. Uh, but I've told a couple people that this series has actually been really challenging for me. Um, taking these metaphorical masks that talk about in psychology and then applying it to a biblical story and seeing it come to life in these characters that we read about, we know, and we love. Uh, it's, been, it's been a challenge, but I'm not one to shy away from a challenge. I was just thinking about this. I remember one fateful Christmas Eve service here in Carlisle, and they're going to throw a couple people under the bus because it's all their fault. Um, I was hanging out with a couple of couples, one of them being the Brownleys, before Christmas Eve. It was my turn to preach Christmas Eve service. And we got talking about the fact that at one point, Pastor Louis would go to someone in the crowd and ask for a word, any word, and that word had to be incorporated into his sermon in any way that he could. And so as the young, overconfident, sometimes overestimating of myself, I was like, well, I could do that, no problem. And so these, two, these four individuals tasked me with incorporating pink flamingo into my Christmas Eve service. Pink flamingo. Anyways, not to boast too much or to pat myself on the back, I did it. And everyone in the service was just enthralled, kind of confused why I would mention pink flamingos in my Christmas Eve service, but enthralled with what I was preaching, except for these four, who were rolling on the floor laughing at the fact that I had actually pulled it off in... Anyways, all that to say, I am not afraid of a challenge. So that brings us to our first question this morning. What would you like us to talk about? If you had a series, if you could control the series and the topics that I talk about, what would you like me to address either Sunday morning or Tuesday at a small group or anytime, really? What would you... What would you like me to talk about from the pulpit or from the stage? Is there anything in particular you'd like me to address? Um, so if you are, everyone online, you can throw it on the comment section. Everyone in house, if you want to go on later, throw it in the comments. I, I am serious. You just, it's wide open. You guys can suggest anything. I'm not saying I'm going to do it, but you can suggest it and keep it on my radar. Um, I have one request, just you know, be honest. Don't throw some goofy stuff out there. And you're like, I hope he does it. <laughs> like, don't do that. Like, and honestly, like, what is something you would like me to talk about and address? Um, or maybe not me. Maybe like Pastor Mitch to throw in his ideas, or we can get Darren. I love doing that. Give me a topic and I'll throw it at Darren. <laughs> Have fun. Okay, I'm gone that week. Um, anyways, as we wrap up our series. The masks that we wear. We're going to look at, as I talk about, we're going to look at Herod and Herodias. And this is kind of an interesting story. There's a lot of background and everything that's going on that we'll go over. But believe it or not, these two individuals are actually wearing the same mask. And they, but they look very different in the way that they come about. And as, when I introduce the mask, this is going to be one of those ones, and I say it every week, that it's going to be easy to hear it and be like, that's not me. I don't ever wear that mask. It's never a struggle for me. And so it'd be easy, once you hear the title, to say, to dis disregard it. But the reality is, is that I think we put this mask on more than we realize. Much like the one we're ta we talked about with the overachiever and the martyr, and last week we talked about the deflector shield, how we use it to hide what's actually going on in our life. And I think we all wear these masks, and never, and it's dependent on the situation, it's dependent on the person that we're talking to, and it's dependent on what we're trying to achieve in the moment when we're talking. And so, um, as we go, don't disregard this, and don't be sitting there like, I hope somebody's listening to this, because that's not helpful. We so often, especially when we read scripture, we so often read the villains in the scripture, and we're like, oh, I'm they're so bad, they, shouldn't have, they should have known better. But the truth is that sometimes we need to read Scripture and put ourselves in the place of the villain. Because believe it or not, we're not always the good guy. We're not always the hero of the story, as much as we'd like to be. Sometimes we are the villain in the story, and God is trying to use the story to form us and transform us into the people so that we can start being the hero more and more often. 
Well, we're in Matthew 14, looking at Herod and Herodias, a little background. This is not Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the king, King Herod, that was ruling over Jerusalem when Jesus was born. He is the one who tried to have Jesus killed. Herod the Great has died, and the plan was that his son, Antipas, would take his place. So it's Herod Antipas that is ruling at the time, but he's not a king. You see, what happened was when Herod the Great was dying, and Herod the Great was a wicked king. He was violent. He ruled with an iron fist. He was just an awful individual. History confirms that for us. Antipas was supposed to take over, and just before death, Herod the Great wrote it in his will that actually he's going to divide his territory between his three sons. And this upset everybody. Two of his sons had no interest in ruling whatsoever. They wanted nothing to do with this. And Antipas was upset because now he's not King Herod. He is what we read in Scripture. He's Herod the Tetrarch. He is just an overseer. He's not even a king. And despite his trying to appeal to Caesar, Caesar says, oh, this is what your dad said. This is what's going to happen. Herod Antipas ruled for 43 years, and generally what we know about him is that he was a peaceful king, he was a builder, he built great monuments and great buildings in Jerusalem. He's remembered fairly well, he's a peacemaker, he was not violent like his dad, but he was indecisive. And I want you to remember that, that even though he was this great king who did things right, he was plagued with the inability to make decisions. He was very indecisive over the course of his rule. And when we get to the story we're going to read today, Antipas is, this is actually the beginning of the end for King Antipas, not King Herod the Tetrarch. See, what has happened is Herod has gone and visited his half-brother in Rome, and he has become infatuated with his half-brother's wife, Herodias. And Herodias is married, and Herod is married. But over the course of this visit, he convinces Herodias to leave her husband, and he would leave his wife, and the two of them would become married. And the reason this is the beginning of the end is obviously this is very like underhanded. We don't, you know, we don't like seeing this happening. But Herod's first marriage also sealed an alliance with a very powerful king that was near the region that Antipas was overseeing. And at the point of the divorce, the other king became so upset, so infuriated that this divorce has happened that his, he mobilizes his army against Herod and wipes out Herod's army. So now he is a tetrarch, he is ruling over an area, and he has no army to support. And then his panic and in his concern, he starts building his army back up. But one of the, his brothers has now stepped away from his, his governorship. A new governor has come in and he sends word to Caesar that Herod's building up an army and he's going to cause a rebellion. And what ends up happening is Antipas and Herodias are actually removed and banished from Jerusalem. So not only are they not ruling anymore, they have nothing. And this happens in a very quick time. Antipas goes from being a very strong leader to having nothing in a very short time. But it all starts with this story about him and his now second wife, his now new wife, Herodias. And when we get to the story, they are now married. And John the Baptist, in a way that only John the Baptist can, is being very vocal about his displeasure about what has gone on. John was not afraid to pull punches, and he was not afraid to stand up and speak the truth and point the, not point the finger, but point out the ways that the king was misbehaving. And so he's pointing to Herod, and he's saying, this is not the way it should be. You should not have taken your brother's wife. You should not have left your wife. You should not have done these things. You have displeased God. Which brings us to Matthew 14. This is what we read, starting in verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus, and he said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work at him. For Herod had seized John, bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, 
Because John had been saying it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. So Herod wants John to stop. John is standing up saying this is not the way it should be. And Herod's trying to get him to stop. He's so upset about what John is saying that he wants to kill him. But he can't do that because he's going to upset the people. So he uses his force. He uses his strength and his military might. And he throws John in jail. Trying to get him to stop saying the things that he's saying. Because generally, but Herod, I don't think Herod actually wanted to kill John. Because we read in other accounts of the gospel that he was actually quite fascinated with the things that John was saying. He just didn't like this one part. Right? We do this sometimes. We uh, we like everything that our pastor says, except for this one thing. This really drives me crazy. I really wish he'd stop saying that. Usually that's the button that we, anyways, I need to get into that. So John had this effect. Herod actually really liked him, except for the fact that he kept talking about how he shouldn't have this wife of his. So he uses force. He forces him to stop talking. He forces him to stop saying these things publicly to the people. And then we meet Herodias, and she's just as bad. Sorry, in verse 6, when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias, so Herodias had a daughter from her first husband, The daughter danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Luke says that Herod promises up to half the kingdom to his stepdaughter. He is so taken aback by this performance. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the heads of John the Baptist here on a platter. The king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. And his disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they went and told Jesus. So Herodias obviously is just as upset about John's message. She's just as upset, but she doesn't have the power. She doesn't have the force. She doesn't have the ability to do what Herod can do. So what does she do? She waits for her moment to strike. It doesn't say it in the story, but Herod, if he's partying with his officials and with his commanders, a good chance he's, he's having a real good time. He's probably a little bit influenced by something. And so he's a little tipsy. He's easily suggestible. And he, he watches his stepdaughter. We don't know what she does. We don't know what kind of dance. But obviously he is so impressed by how well she danced, by how well she did everything, that he is just like, I'm so taken aback, I'll give you anything up to half. And what is going on is Herodias has put his, her daughter up to this, and he, she is manipulating her husband to get what she wants. She's not as forceful, she's not as upfront, she's not as aggressive as Her- Herod, but she is still doing the same thing. She's manipulating circumstances to get her way. Should we do my second question, which is the lead up to this? Have you ever struggled with insecurity? I think at some point we all have. Maybe we, it is an ongoing struggle. Maybe it's something that we have we can remember a time where there's certain situations where we struggle with it, but do you struggle with insecurity? And maybe based on the story and based on the question, you kind of know where I'm going with this, but that's okay. Don't say anything. Don't wreck it for anybody else. But do you struggle? Do you struggle with self-confidence? Do you struggle with your self-image? Do you struggle with insecurity? The mask we're looking at this morning is the mask of the bully. And believe it or not, Herod and Herodias are both wearing this mask. Because what the mask of the bully is, is that we, the wearer of the mask, is trying to control another individual, and they are doing it one of two ways. For in Herod's case, he's aggressive. He uses his strength, he uses his power, he uses his position, and he forces his will upon John and he says you will not speak to the people in this way anymore he bullies John 
into stopping what he is doing. And another part, and so this is why we are usually quick to disregard the bully, right? Oh, I'm not aggressive. I don't, I don't force, I don't, I don't pick on people. I don't, I don't make belittle people. I don't, you know, all these other things that bullies like to do, right? I'm not aggressive. I'm very tenderhearted, actually. <laughs> but it's the second mass that sometimes gets us. You may not be aggressive. You may not be overbearing or forceful or overconfident, but maybe you are, maybe you use manipulation to get your way. Maybe it's a little more subtle. It's just a little bit of manipulation of the facts or manipulation of someone's emotion. Or some mani- and believe it or not, this is still bullying. It's still getting someone to think something, do something that they otherwise would not do. You are taking what you want accomplished and forcing it upon somebody else. And we see this a lot today with social media and on the news and whatnot, right? We see one of two people. I'm going to get my tablet for this next part, right? We turn on the social media, and there's the guy who's like standing there. He's just yelling at you, and he's screaming at you. That you should believe what I believe, and if you don't, you're an idiot. And blah, like, he's just so forceful. He's just so confident. You just, you're almost scared not to agree with him. And then you have the people who are like, well... I really would like you to agree with me, and if you're not agreeing with me, if you don't take my stance, well, then you're just a racist, sexist bigot. Whoa! Wow! Okay, now I feel guilty for not agreeing with you. Now I feel guilty for not coming alongside with you. Both are the same mask. Both are the same thing. And what we know about the mask of the bully is behind it, behind the aggression, behind the overconfidence, behind it all is this insecurity and is this this fear. The reason that the person is so forceful about their opinion is that they are this deep-seated fear that you're going to disagree with them and they're going to be wrong. So instead of acknowledging the fact that maybe they're wrong, they're just going to yell and scream and be forceful and overconfident and say, you need to agree with me whoa, they must really know what they're talking about. Well, no, actually, they're probably really insecure about their position, and they're just hoping that you don't figure that out. There's insecurity, there's self-doubt, there's so many things at work, and, the old, and there's this, the mask of the bully is a compensation for it to make sure you don't figure that out. So you don't figure out that this person is scared. You don't figure out this person is insecure. You don't figure out this person has doubts about what they're saying and what they're doing. It's just so that you don't know what's actually going on. And so the question is, is how do we get this mask off? How do we ensure that when we have those moments of insecurity, when we have those moments of self-doubt, because we all do, We're not impervious to it. Nobody is above feeling insecure or uncomfortable. So how do we, how do we take this mask off? And not just take it off, make sure that we, we keep it off. Where do we find the confidence? Because the problem is, and it comes back to this idea, I'm going to pull up the tablet for another reason. There used to be a time where people, were, primarily ladies, would carry a mirror in their purse, right? Ladies, some of you remember this. What do we do now? Turn on the selfie camera. So whether you're looking in the mirror or you're looking in the selfie camera, the question is, is how do you feel about the person who's looking back at you? How do you feel about how you look physically? How do you feel about your confidence level? How do you feel about... How do you feel about the decisions that you've made? How do you feel about that fight you just had with your spouse or your loved one? How do you feel? How do you feel about that? How does how do you feel about that person? And how do we get to the point where we are not afraid of the mirror? How do we get to the point where we're not afraid of the selfie camera? Where how do we get to the point where 
We don't have to worry about putting on this mask of the bully as a front of what is actually going on inside of us. And the first thing I thought of when I was thinking about this was the words of Paul to young Timothy. So the Apostle Paul is writing to his young, his son in the faith. It's a second letter, it says Timothy. And Timothy is young, he's leading this church, and he's probably got fears, he's probably got insecurities, he's probably got worries about what's going on. And so Paul writes to him, and in the first chapter of the second letter, Paul says this to Timothy. He says, for God gave us, not a, gave us a spirit not of fear. You don't have to be worried. You don't have to question. You don't have to be insecure. Because he gave us a spirit of power, of love, and of self-control. Oh. And Paul says this a lot. He says it in Romans 8, that if God is for you, who can be against you? If God has called you, if God loves you, if God is, if God goes before you, who can be against you? What do you have to be afraid of? What do you have to be worried about? What do you have, because God has set you apart. That spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, that same spirit that set the world in motion, that set the sun and the stars in the sky and it's allotted the, the water and the land of their borders, that same spirit that hovered over the deep and initiated creation, that same spirit at the moment of your salvation has come upon you and is the seal of your salvation, that spirit is there and all too often we forget that. And so we try to accomplish things on our own strength, and when we realize we're not strong enough, we get, we get concerned. We realize we're not smart enough, we start to question ourselves. So this mask is very different. The overachiever, the one thing that the overachiever and the bully have in common is that it's usually all about control, but the overachiever is anxious. The overachiever, the perfectionist, is afraid of something going wrong. The bully is afraid that someone's going to disagree with them and prove them wrong. And if your confidence, and as long as your confidence resides in yourself, we're always at the risk of feeling insecure and afraid of not only ourselves, but of somebody else saying something to us. And so we need to not rely on our own strength. We need to not rely on our own identity, but we need to rely on the identity that we get because of the spirit that dwells within us. God did not give you a spirit of fear. He did not give you a spirit of insecurity. He did not give you a spirit of self-doubt. He gave you a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. And all three of those things are so important. Self-control, because if we are acting in a way that is contrary to the teaching of God, we start to question ourselves. We start to hope that nobody ever finds out about it. So self-control comes in and prevents us from living a life that is contrary to the word that God has given us. It's contrary to the life that Jesus has called us to because of our salvation. It's giving you a spirit of power because Everything that's coming at you, you may be strong, but God is stronger, and God wants to give you the power to overcome any obstacle, any challenge, any difficult situation. It's giving you power and of love. And this next one is so important because as soon as I think about love, I'm reminded of Matthew, this passage in Matthew, the two great commandments. The first one is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. The second one is like it. And we need, I think it is so important that we remind ourselves of the second commandment as much as we remind ourselves of the first. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. See, there's a, there's a, there's something, there's that, that little, those last two words are so important It's so hard to love other people if you don't love yourself. It's so hard to give what you don't even have for yourself because you because if you don't love yourself, how can anyone else love you? Right? That's just the thought. It's not true. Is the 
farthest thing from the truth. You are loved. You are adored. Jesus loved you so much that he died on the cross to take away your sins so that you could have a relationship with his Father. Jesus loves you. Even when you were enemies, even when you were turned your back and doing things that were contrary to God's teaching, Jesus still loved you. Jesus still died for you. So if Jesus loves you that much, and God loves you that much, and I guarantee that your family loves you, then why do you struggle with loving yourself? Question three, what keeps you from loving you? And maybe it's not you just it's not that you hate yourself, but there's just things about you that you're just like, I really don't like this about myself. I really, and some of it is in our control. Some of it is we can, we can overcome. We can speak life into that situation, and we can overcome some of these things. But some of these things are just like, God, I need your help. Because I know that you love me. I know that you see past this thing and see my future and see the good things you have planned for me, but I'm really struggling with seeing past it. Help me see past this problem. So I have a, I have a take-home assignment for you today to help you with this. I want everyone to do it because... I think we all need, some of you are overconfident, some of you love yourselves too much, and maybe this would be a good way to like bring you down a couple pegs, but some of us really need to work on this love of myself, that God loves me and everyone else, everyone around me loves me, maybe I need to love me too, and this is the exercise. The challenge came out a while ago, um, take a piece of paper and split the paper into two, two sections, and on one side, you were tasked with writing down five things you like about yourself. Just five things. And on the other side of the paper, you're tasked with writing down ten things you don't like about yourself. And the question was, which list is easier to come up with? 90% of people say, I can come up with that ten things I don't like about myself pretty quick. In fact, I, can, I don't have to stop at ten. I can just keep going. But the important thing is, is that we need to be able to work on that list of things that we do actually like about ourselves. And some of us maybe have a tough time with that list. You don't have to do it by yourself. You can stop and say, God, what do you love about me? Or maybe you go to your spouse or a friend or a loved one that you trust and that speaks life into you. Maybe you just say, what is something you like about me? Because right now, I don't like myself. Right now, I'm really struggling with my identity. I'm really struggling with my confidence. I'm really struggling. What is it that you like about me? And so the challenge I have for you this week, and if you're a journaler, then you have something to journal about for the next seven days. If you're not a journaler, PharmaSafe has some cheap journals. I'll hook you up with a journal if it gets you to do this little project this week. But every day this week, take some time and write out five things. And don't do the same five things every day. Oh, this is easy. I got the first one done. No, that's cheating. Every day, five new things. Five things. And all of a sudden, you're going to have a pretty good long list. All of a sudden, you're just going to start to realize that, oh, maybe I'm not so bad. Maybe I, maybe I am pretty good. Maybe I am pretty lovable. Maybe I am... And maybe I can be used of God. Because when we don't love ourselves, and when we're lacking that, when we're riddled with insecurity, and we're lacking that confidence, we start to doubt the fact that God can actually use us to accomplish his things. And that is simply not the case. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. God can use you no matter where you are, no matter what you're struggling with, no matter what, no matter who you see when you look in the mirror. God can use you, God loves you, and God has called you to things greater than you could ever imagine. Let's pray. Father, I pray, I pray, God, as we think about what, everything that was said this morning, that we would do one of two things, that we would recognize the times where we have put on the mask of the bully, Maybe unintentionally and maybe accidentally and maybe that very thought upsets us. But God, I pray that you would help us to minimize the times 
that we put on the mask of the bully. And God, I also pray that as we think about everything that was said, that we would recognize the struggle that maybe somebody else is in our life is going through. Maybe somebody is making our life difficult and making life really tough, and we need to recognize the fact that they have their own struggles. And God, I pray for the grace, I pray for the love, I pray for the forgiveness that is needed to love that person through this tough time. Father, I pray for everyone who struggles with confidence and struggles with insecurity, that God, that they would find their identity in you because what you say about us is unchanging. Because the truth that you have declared over us is eternal. And that we would find our confidence over what you have said. And find our security in the fact that you establish us and you go before us. Father, help us with this list. I pray, Holy Spirit, for everybody who's hearing my voice, that you would remind them every day, hey, it's time to do the list. Hey, it's, hey, it's time to sit down and do the list. I pray, God, that we would see the fruit in it, that we would be encouraged by it, and that we would become stronger in our faith because of it. Jesus, we love you. Give you all our praise and thanks in your precious name. Amen.